Uh, it's good to be here, and I'm glad all of you joined us uh, from your busy schedules this evening. Uh, hopefully, some of this is worthwhile to you. Um, so, you know, we have these clever acronyms in our technology world, and MEAN is probably one of the best ones, I think, in my opinion. Um, and, uh, you know, for the next 30 minutes, if you will just indulge me and pretend that, you know, the A stands for Atlas, you know, I would really appreciate that. And also, you know, we are at Encore, we are not really using Angular, so, you know, that, that's just fine. <coughs> A little bit about myself, you know, I totally understand the name could be tricky to pronounce. Um, it's pretty much phonetic, except for the A's. Uh, the hint on the A's is that, you know, if you know how to say Raphael or, you know, even Barack Obama for that matter, you know, the A's are just like that, you know, say them like that. Bam C, like I'm sunny. Pretty straightforward, right? Um, although I think uh, Raphael is a little bit closer to Barack Obama on the fame scale than I am. So, <laughs> um, so I personally moved... Um, to the Bay Area almost 20 years ago, uh, because people told me that the weather is really good here, and you know, so far, you know, definitely no disappointments on that. Um, and also, uh, to actually start a company, right? So uh, a few friends of mine, we had an idea, and late 90s was around the time when uh, Java was a new language, it's like a new kid on the block, you know, kind of like in a GoLang right now, right? So we just saw an opportunity to leverage the uh, the cross-platform nature of Java and uh, create a software product for telecommunications data ma uh, network management. And uh, this company was uh, completely uh, bootstrapped, self-funded, and uh, we grew the company, and then uh, later on, one of our customers you know, acquired our company. <clears throat> that customer was funded by uh, Kleiner Perkins, and they went on to become public. So, you know, definitely, you know, a good first startup experience for a lot of us. And after that, I did a lot of consulting for startups in the Bay Area. Uh, before settling on uh, an interesting project that combines computer science with physics, right? Um, this is, uh, some of you may not know this, but uh, the world's biggest laser beam is actually right here in the East Bay uh, at uh, uh, United States Department of Energy lab called Lawrence Livermore National Lab, right? You can even get a tour of it if you like. You can take your kids and show, show the laser beam. Now, you might be wondering, you know, what the laser beam can do, right? It can create high energy densities like in the sun, um, and uh, it's used for two purposes. One is uh, to make sure that the nuclear weapons that our country has are, 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 are still functional, right? Because if you want to use the weapons, you want to make sure it, they're going to work, right? So that's the main purpose of the, of the laser beam. A secondary purpose is also to explore uh, clean energy, right? So the laser beam can actually make um, a, a mini sun in the lab. It's called nuclear fusion. That's a physics phenomena that it's able to explore. So I spent almost nine years there. Um, and as you can imagine, because it's a nuclear weapons lab, a lot of security emphasis is involved there, right? Information security, infrastructure security, data security, and also write software to actually control the laser and fire the laser beams. It was kind of a fun, fun project. And to analyze the data that comes out of the laser, right? So, you know, if you're a Star Trek fan, uh, Star Trek Into Darkness in 2013 was actually filmed on site where the laser uh, was used as the fusion core of the Enterprise of the ship. So uh, towards the uh, later uh, year set at Lawrence Livermore, I started getting, you know, we had iOS coming up and Android coming up, and I started getting more interested in the mobile uh, application development. And I left the lab uh, to take a position as a chief architect at uh, uh, an enterprise software company called CA Technologies here in Santa Clara to build a, a mobile security and mobile analytics product. Um, and this is where I met uh, Jonathan, who is the CEO of Encore. And he came to CA through an acquisition where he sold his company to CA. And we got together and we actually built a, a small team, an MVP, right? Uh, a minimum viable product. Um, and uh, the product was successful. It was funded uh, by CA. And uh, uh, it grew to almost $10 million in revenue by the time we left. And uh, the team that we have at CA continues to thrive and do pretty well uh, on, on this project. So, so that brings me to Encore. <coughs> Encore, uh, we've been at it almost uh, for a little bit. Uh, it's good to be here, and I'm glad all of you joined us uh, from your busy schedules this evening. Uh, hopefully, some of this is worthwhile to you. Um, so, you know, we have these clever acronyms in our technology world, and MEAN is probably one of the best ones, I think, in my opinion. Um, and, uh, you know, for the next 30 minutes, if you will just indulge me and pretend that, you know, the A stands for Atlas, you know, I would really appreciate that. And also, you know, we are at Encore, we are not really using Angular, so, you know, that, that's just fine. <clears throat> a little bit about myself, you know, I totally understand the name could be tricky to pronounce. Um, it's pretty much phonetic, except for the A's. Uh, 
the hint on the ace is that you know if you know how to say Raphael or you know even Barack Obama for that matter, you know the A's are just like that. You know, say them like that. Bamsi, like I'm Sunny. Pretty straightforward, right? Um, although I think uh, Raphael is a little bit closer to Barack Obama on the fame scale than I am. So, <laughs> um, so I personally moved um, to the Bay Area almost 20 years ago uh, because people told me that the weather is really good here, and you know, so far, you know, definitely no disappointments on that. Um, and also uh, to actually start a company, right? So uh, a few friends of mine, we had an idea. And late 90s was around the time when uh, Java was a new language. It's like a new kid on the block, you know, kind of like in a Golang right now, right? So we, we saw an opportunity to leverage the, uh, the cross-platform nature of Java and uh, create a software product for telecommunications data ma uh, network management. And uh, this company was uh, completely uh, bootstrapped, self-funded. And uh, we grew the company, and then uh, later on, one of our customers you know, acquired our company. <clears throat> that customer was funded by uh, Kleiner Perkins, and they went on to become public. So, you know, definitely, you know, a good first startup experience for a lot of us. And after that, I did a lot of consulting for startups in the Bay Area uh, before settling on uh, an interesting project that combines computer science with physics, right? Um, this is, uh, some of you may not know this, but uh, the world's biggest laser beam is actually right here in the East Bay uh, at uh, uh, United States Department of Energy lab called Lawrence Livermore National Lab, right? You can even get a tour of it if you like. You can take your kids and show, show the laser beam. Now, you might be wondering you know, what the laser beam can do, right? It can create high energy densities like in the sun, um, and uh, it's used for two purposes. One is uh, to make sure that the nuclear weapons that are So there, that's uh, encoded in a nutshell for you guys. Uh, <clears throat> see here, I can get back here. So uh, I think you know uh, the way. So the, the, you know when you when you make a consumer-based mobile app, right? You know the way you, you measure the effectiveness of the app is that if people that actually try your app on the first day are they even coming back, right? Uh, there's a metric called retention rate. And um, although you know our user count is not that high right now, um, our retention is 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 very high. It's comparable to the top you know 100, 100 150 apps, and we're certainly encouraged by that. And I think you know for us you know it's been viral marketing so far in getting the user base that we have. But uh, we're actually working with uh, you know both NBC and CBS actively um, to make our the official app uh, for what, some of the shows like Survivor for example, right? So I think you know that's what we think is going to take us to six figures and seven figures in terms of user count. And um, you know that's uh, that's that's our plan. <coughs> so um, you know you've seen the video, right? Um, I'm going to show you some screenshots of the app. You know you can certainly download it from the App Store, or iOS, or Android. And we have a game that op that closes at five o'clock every every week right now. In a Bachelorette, Bachelor there's a TV show called Bachelorette on ABC. So at five o'clock uh, Pacific time, the, the game closes. You can play it. But let me show you some screens on how the the game works. So you sign up. You know there's a lot of uh, you know we have we let you sign up with the social media accounts. And uh, you know there is a lot, you know, chat and social media features, and some of these features, you know, uh, I'll connect you to how we might use MongoDB to implement some of them uh, in the future. Right now, we're we're implementing in some way, but I think there's new features of MongoDB that let us implement some of these social features. And uh, you would join a game, and uh, there would there there is a, a currency that's involved. So let me. Um, All right, so uh, you know if you see over here, right? Uh, this is the uh, uh, chips that you use an ent entrance into the into the game, and then um, you would actually then use uh, the uh, if you play well in the game, you would win these call these these call coins, you know, virtual currency that you win, um, and then. Um, right, so what you would do is you know just like in fantasy sports, right? There is this different positions of players. Like a quarterback or a you know um, halfback or a defensive position, right? So we came up with these positions for bachelorette, for example. There's a position called stud position, right? So depending on how the guy does, you know, there's a bunch of things that he would do that make him a stud, and then you would win points if you draft him on your team, and then you can also actually have questions answered, um, you can, like a prediction question, right? So these questions you have to answer them before the show starts. Uh, so this is the stuff that you would do before the show. 
Uh, and on the next slide, I'm going to show you what happens, you know, after the show or during the show, right? Um, <clears throat> so, so this is a case where, you know, one of my questions that I have answered uh, turned out to be the wrong question, right? Means it's wrong. And I'm not, I'm hardly an expert in bachelorette. So, you know, I play the games, but I tend to lose them. Um, so, you know, in this case, you know, this guy actually did some stud like things, like kissing or you know, getting a rose. Uh, so we, he got some points there. But overall, if you look at the leaderboard, which is, you know, very interactively changes during the game, um, you know, I place 10th in this game, like I do most of the time. So <laughs> there are all these sharks that come and take my money, my chips. And you can exchange some of these uh, coins that you win for, oh, well, there's profile, there's stats. There's, we, we, keep, we keep track of different statistics for every player. Um, and, um, and then you can actually exchange your, uh, your virtual currency for gift cards. So this is the basic you know, idea of the game. So having seen some of these features, right, uh, let's explore some of the technology architecture behind it. Um, so, so we have these iOS apps and uh, we have, uh, you know, some apps on the Android, Android as well. And, you know, the basic architecture that we have is, is fairly simple. So this is like a one point architecture that we have, you know, as we have, as we scale up, you know, I would imagine some of this will, will also evolve. But for now, um, <clears throat> you've got, you know, the mobile apps up there and you've got, we also have an admin user and uh, you know, there's a node a backend server and then there's MongoDB. So if you look at our MVP, we actually did the MVP in three different stages. So at the alpha stage, uh, for instance, we had um, all these guys, right? They were all running on the same EC2 virtual machine. So that's our like, you know, alpha MVP, uh, not really scalable, but it worked. And then uh, we had a subsequent uh, beta MVP where we introduced Redis. So we had those running on the same VM, but for MongoDB, we uh, switched over to Atlas. And you know, with a, with a small team like ours, right? Um, you know, obviously, you know, development and ops have to really work together and ops is as important as, as, as development. And uh, you, know, you need to get it ops completely right. And we just didn't have the, you know, the, the capacity to hire somebody who's dedicated at least half time to ops. So we're really lucky to have found Atlas uh, which filled that need for us in terms of you know database availability and scalability, and then um, and then you know as this thing evolved, you know this is uh, see here. Right. So uh, so we talked about you know the, the the alpha MVP. We talked about the beta MVP, right? So the final MVP uh, I'm going to show you right now. But before that, I want to show you guys. You know, if you're familiar with Amazon Web Services, right? Uh, the common architecture is that you would have uh, an elastic load balancer up there, um, like up here, and then you know you would have these uh, private subnets, right? So you would, you put a middleware and you put your, your database in the private subnets. So so this is uh, so this is very similar in, in how we built our architecture. Um, so you know at the bottom of the of the of the, of the stack, you'll see uh, in the middle there's a, there's a Node.js cluster right here. Right, um, and see here, and we've got uh, a Redis cluster here, and then we've got a uh, MongoDB Atlas cluster right there. Right, so th this is the uh, this, this is this is the system we have, and and I think you know as you can see, we also have this thing called application load balancer. Let me show you if I can tap here. So this is the application load balancer. So uh, if you remember from the architecture slide, we not only have REST APIs to our servers, we also have this WebSocket, which is able to push data to the to the mobile apps, right? So, so Amazon's application load balancer was pretty handy in terms of being able to, you know, load balance not just the REST layer, but also be, being able to load balance the WebSocket layer, right? Um, and our Node.js is completely uh, using uh, Amazon auto scaling, so we can actually grow and shrink as we need. Um, the Redis and uh, MongoDB Atlas, you know, are still not completely connected with auto scaling, and that's something that we would like to see happen as we go forward. And um, you know, you might be wondering, you know, why MongoDB made, made sense for us, right? So this is this is a little bit of an explanation for that. You know, when I worked at CA Technologies, we actually prototyped with the main stack, uh, but that product was something that you had to actually uh, ship on premise as well as for SaaS, right? So this is this has to work in both ways. Now, if you ship something on-premise, right, you have to actually, with Node, for example, you have to ship the source code. Although I think there's options now to compile Node into a binary format. But generally speaking, it's kind of hard to figure out a way by which you can ship Node.js into an on-premise situation. 
And then the second thing is that, you know, with MongoDB, um, we had some concerns about um, database locking, right? So if you guys remember, you know, MongoDB has something called a storage engine behind it, uh, MMAP, and, uh, you know, right now they have something called Wired Tiger. So the MMAP storage engine would lock at the database level, which was somewhat of a concern to us two, three years ago. So at CA, we decided not to use um, MongoDB or Node.js stack. Instead, we went with something called you know, the Cassandra-based stack. Uh, <clears throat> but here, at Encore, not only has the global locking problem has been solved through Wired Tiger storage engine, but um, you know, this is a completely SaaS product, so we don't have to share the source code anywhere, right? So this, that's why the main stack really you know, made a lot of sense for us here. <clears throat> And although I show two nodes at each layer, um, that is just like an, for an example, right? Because you know, most of you know that you know, if you can get the app to work with one node, you know, that's one thing. But once you add the second node, right, you know, to keep something completely horizontally scalable, you need to figure out a way to put the state in the database, the permanent state in the database. So for us, we keep the permanent state in, in MongoDB, the, the persistent long-term state. And then we use Redis, where we keep the you know, transient state, right, um, which, uh, which is uh, which involves you know websocket related state and you know, things like that. All right, so this is uh, you know the basic architecture that we have, and <clears throat> so in terms of MongoDB, um, currently in terms of Atlas, right? These are the features we are using. Um, there is we use a lot of security based features uh, in terms of role based access control, and I'm going to show us. Uh, we're going to get into a demo pretty soon, which is probably the most more fun part for some of you guys, um, but. I'm going to show you the first two aspects of MongoDB, maybe not monitoring, but definitely the role-based access control, the whitelisting, um, and uh, you know, VPC peering is a little bit hard to demo, but I'll just show you guys how to set it up. Uh, this is by, this is, this is, if you go back to the previous slide, uh, VPC peering is, is a way by which, uh, let me just go back one more here. So VPC peering is, is a way by which your middleware connects to uh, MongoDB, right? So this is like a private connection directly that you have between your, your backend uh, middleware and, and MongoDB. And uh, you know, I think uh, this is something that I'm not going to spend too much time on, but clearly you, know, you need to have a good DevOps uh, stack there. So you know, the purpose of this DevOps stack is that we want to push new features really fast to our users, maybe multiple times a week. And also if something bad happens, we like to know pretty soon, really fast, right? So this is, we built kind of a Slack-centric stack uh, monitoring and automation that helps us, you know, really keep track of what's going on. All right, um, and you know, there is other features of MongoDB like you know backups and queryable backups and uh, being able to resize the clusters that we've used. These are a little bit harder to demo, but I'm going to show you some screenshots on some of these guys. All right, so now um, you know, Raphael actually talked in the last meetup about you know Lambda and how to secure MongoDB passwords in the context of Lambda, right? Um, so I'm going to kind of build up on what he did and uh, show you guys, you know, how we, we might manage passwords uh, in the context of a non-Lambda context, right? Which is probably a lot of you guys are actually not yet in Lambda. Um, so, <clears throat> all right. So now for, you know, the fun part, some of the demos, right? Um, let's see. So to begin the demo, what I've done was I've set up like a test MongoDB cluster for this demo, and I've also set up a a test Amazon, you know, uh, web services console. So let's start with that first, and then we'll kind of get into a command line demo. All right. So, so here you're seeing you're looking at a MongoDB Atlas uh, uh, account I set up, right? And uh, let's go here to the clusters. There's one cluster called Mug, right? Pretty simple. Um, and by the way, let me just kill some of these guys. All right. So um, you know, it's free to try, and there's some features that are actually limited, but you know, it's, you can try a lot of these features. And in here, I've set up two users. So one is uh, a user with a lot of privileges, and then the other is actually a, a user that has read-only access, right? Um, so these are the user accounts that we're going to use to uh, execute the MongoDB APIs, right? Uh, now, also, let me show you guys um, on the cluster itself. There's a security tab, right? So here, you know, these are the accounts that you have. These are actually the database accounts, right? These are different from the, uh, the console accounts. 
So even in the database, right, I have two users. I have like a, a mug app user, you know, which is actually a, uh, has only a permissions to read write to a database called mug. And then we have the admin user, you know, who has got all kinds of privileges, right? So I'll show you guys how things are different in terms of you log in with which user. Okay, <clears throat> so going back to the user list here. So let's go to our command line. Okay. So um, one of the first things you like to do, right, when you set up a MongoDB cluster, you know, they give you uh, a, a connection string, right, which is an SSL-based connection string, right? So you uh, grab the connection string, and then um, I'm going to show you guys the script here. Right? So as you can see, we have uh, an admin user, right, and then a, a non-admin user, right? So I'm going to try to log in as a non-admin user into my database. And um, and see if that works or not, right? So, right now, so if I just do MongoDB dot sh, so I'm connected, right? And then it gives you this kind of an error because uh, you know this uh, non-admin user doesn't have certain privileges, right? So if if you do like you know show dbs, right? So it goes to just kind of say you know this user is not allowed to you know look at the databases or anything like that. Okay, so now we're going to change this uh, MongoDB script, and then we're going to connect as admin user. All right, and I think you know one thing you may have noticed is that you know the password, right? The password for the MongoDB user. I'm not storing the script, right? Because I'm using a tool called CredStash. It stands for stashing credentials. I'm going to give you a little demo of this tool. This is an open source Node.js based uh, tool that lets you actually store your credentials uh, in Amazon's uh, key management system or the key store, right? So I'll show you a little more details about this one. And keep in mind that this is not anything Mongo specific. You, know, you can use it with any kind of tool that you have. As long as you're on Amazon uh, based stack, you should be able to use this. And okay, so we have done that. And now if I go and log in as MongoDB user, and by the way, all the scripts I'm showing you guys and source code I'm showing you guys, I'm going to make it available in a GitHub repository that you, you can you know, download and play with it. So as you can see, you know, there's no error message at all, right? And you can also do show DBs. So you know, it, it lets you do more stuff than you know, the, the non-admin user, right? Now, um, now, so having seen how role-based access control works for database users, right? So now let's move on to um, accessing the API of, of, of Atlas itself. So Atlas has actually a REST-based API where you can actually control who can connect from what IP address, right? So there's a, there's a feature called IP whitelisting where you can say only from this IP somebody can connect, right? So I'm going to show you guys a, a script that invokes a REST API, right? <clears throat> so the script is called api.sh, right? So uh, Again, okay. as you saw in the, in the MongoDB admin console, we have two users, right? We have a user ID that's like an admin user, and we have a user ID that's a like non-admin user, right? So, uh, so I'm going to actually run as a, a non-admin user. Actually, it doesn't matter. So I think in the first demo, we'll just run as an admin user, right? So I'm going to run this script called api.sh, all right? So what the script is doing is, um, and I'll show you what it's doing. It's uh, actually uh, connecting to the MongoDB REST API, MongoDB Atlas REST API, and downloading the list of IP addresses that are allowed to connect to the database in the first place, right? So right now, this IP is, is being allowed, and how did I get this IP, right? This is actually the IP, uh, if you go to uh, get my IP, right? So the Netflix network actually is presented to MongoDB as an IP address. So, so we have this IP as on the whitelist you know, for MongoDB Atlas to be able to connect, right? Now, um, let's try and remove this IP address from the whitelist, right? Now, you can remove this IP address in the whitelist either by going to the GUI console, or you can actually invoke the REST API 
to remove from the whitelist, right? So I'm going to actually go ahead and remove this IP address from the whitelist. And we'll see how, what kind of impact that has on the Mongo shell connection we had before. So let's open this up. So this is the command to delete the IP address. Okay. All right. Okay, so this command has succeeded, right? So now if you run the IP, IP whitelist command again, you're not going to see it anymore. So I'm just going to can't comment on the delete command because we've already deleted that. Right. So there's no IP whitelist, right? So now let's try the Mongo shell command that we were trying before. It's not able to connect anymore, right? Because the IP whitelist, IP has been taken out of the whitelist. So, um, you know, there's, there's one more thing. We, let's try to add the IP address back, right? Um, so, I'm going to try to add the IP address back, but not as an admin user. I'm going to try to add it as a non-admin user, right? So, let's comment out this, uh, and then let's go ahead and enable this guy. This is a non-admin user like I was showing you in the beginning. And then uh, we would actually like to add the IP address, right? This is actually the command to add it. Uh, right. Okay. So this user is not allowed to add IP addresses because this is a non-admin user. So we can go ahead and kind of change the uh, add this again. Okay, and then I'm gonna read on this command here. Okay, so it's been added, and then you should be able to do a, a MongoDB SSH again. It's gonna take some time, so you have to give it, you know, like a few, few minutes or so. Um, all right, so let's see if, if byte listing has been updated. Okay, so we got the whitelist back up there. All right, so that kind of concludes uh, some of the command line scripting demo. So I'm going to move on to uh, a different. So we saw console and API access, and we saw how to get the you know using whitelisting. Right? We saw those two. So now I'm going to show you guys you know how you might do some of this in your Node.js application, right? Um, <clears throat> because this is is not just a, a command line tool, but it's also a, an npm module that you can use. So. We saw all this. All right, so how do you how do you kind of in the bottom line is you know you need to supply the password somehow, right? So so we'll show you some code on how to do that. So for that, I'm gonna actually bring up um, an ID called WebStorm, which I use for Node.js programming. You know, I don't know what you guys use, but this is a pretty good one. So uh, all this code is again available on the GitHub repository, but um, just to give you an overview of the code structure, right? Um, <clears throat> so we've got a, a Mongoose model, right? Which uh, defines a, a table called events, right? So in Encore, you know, we have events for Bachelorette, we have events for Survivor, for TV, every TV show has an event in Encore for us. And you know, this is like a really stripped down version of the real event we have at Encore. So it's got just a name and description and you know, some app ID stuff. So we define the model, right? And then we also define a controller uh, which kind of operates on the model, right? Um, <clears throat> so, so what the controller is doing is it's initializing the credentials uh, by you know, using cred stash, grabbing all the passwords, and setting them into environment variables, right? So uh, there's actually a config file that says this environment variable comes from that key in cred stash, right? This is like a mapping of you know environment variables to the keys. You don't have to do this, but this is just a way to kind of keep them a little separated in terms of the keys in the cred stash, 
and the uh, environment variables you use in, in your MongoDB code. All right, so having done that, so if you go to uh, here, right? Uh, so, th so this is just kind of setting the environment variables. Uh, that's what the in credits is doing. And, and then um, we have a, uh, a Mocha test, right? Which, you know, I've got two tests here. So th this test, th I'm skipping this test right now, but I'm just going to uh, run this test. So all this is doing is it's just, you know, uh, using the controller and grabbing a credential with that key. That's all it's doing, right? And um, I think uh, maybe I can show you the package.json as well, which has its dependencies. We've got MongoDB, Mongoose. Uh, this is actually the NPM module that's used by Credstash. And then it also uses the uh, Amazon Web Services JavaScript SDK uh, to do its job. Uh, these are like, you know, promises and stuff that's kind of supportive, right? So let's run the tests here. Let's see if the password can be obtained. Uh, see here. So yeah, it, it actually read it and it actually got the password out of it, right? Um, <clears throat> and then, um, so we can actually, uh, let's skip this guy. And we're gonna enable this guy. I mean, you could run up both the tests at the same time. I'm just running them separately to show you guys what they're doing a little differently. So what this is doing is it is actually, uh, remember I was showing you guys that you know, it's setting those variables, right? So this test, it just prints each of the variables as after it's being set. So let's just run this guy. Right. So, uh, you know, there's probably not much to see here. Uh, actually, no, it, there is, there is, right? So you can see that it's printing this, these variables that it, it actually set up, right? So that's what it's done. I think we're just printing the, the Mongo URL variable. We're not printing the password right now, right? And that leads us into the main, uh, sorry about this. <laughs> I don't know, I should have stopped these guys somehow. Okay, so let's go to uh, the main um, application.js, which is right here, right? So in the main application.js, we are actually, the controls that we saw that we tested with Mocha, you know, we're importing that. Uh, we have the event model. And um, you know, some of you may, may be familiar with this thing called async await, which is a new uh, JavaScript, you know, um, ES6 paradigm that uh, frees you from the callback hell, right? So you could just you know write your JavaScript code just like you write your Java code, you know, very sequential, and it awaits for you. So what we're doing is we are saying, you know, hey, wait until the credentials are initialized, and then make a connection to MongoDB, and then uh, make a new event object, right? And then we save the event object, and then we find it, and then we print it. So this is this is basically the the steps there. Um, I'm going to say just change it a little bit, right? So let's call this as uh, you know bachelor. All right, so we made a new object like that, and let's just run app.js now. Okay, so it finished it, and it also actually printed the, uh, the description. And then if you, if you were to go to Mongo shell now, uh, so db.events. Yeah, so you can see that this added actually a new entry into the events table uh, that we have actually done it from our Node.js code, right? So what happened there was, you know, the Node.js code, um, you know, utilized cred stash to grab the passwords from the um, from Amazon key management system, and then it connected to the database. It added an entry, right? So um, so hopefully this you, you guys have a bit good feel for how to do scripting or how to do from Node.js code and keep the passwords somewhat secure in the Amazon key store using cred stash. Um, so let's see here if there is, um, let's go back to the presentation. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, if you were using, if you're an Amazon, Amazon, right? So I think uh, um, there is, uh, the, the way, you know, security works in Amazon is that every instance can have something called an instance profile. And so what you would do is you would set up the instance profile 
um, and give it some permission so it, so it can actually access you know, the Amazon's uh, key management system. And therefore, that instance is able to actually make red stash calls back to the uh, key KMS, get the passwords, and then make connection to MongoDB, right? So uh, in, the, uh, in the Git repository, I've actually included, uh, let's see if it can be, I think maybe you do it from the command line, okay? So I just go exit here. See this file called cred stash IAM policy, right? Uh, if you look at this policy, you know, this policy actually, uh, you know, assigns permissions so it can, the instance can actually grab data from the Amazon KMS. All right, so as far as BPC peering is concerned, you know, I'm, I won't be able to demo it completely, but I'll just show you guys, you know, how you might set up a BPC peering. So if you go to the Atlas, right? So here you can actually do, go to clusters. You can go to security, and there's this thing called peering. Then you can actually set up a new peering uh, configuration. So this, it's a screen with a bunch of fields, you know, fields that you enter. So you supply the VPC ID of your, your own VPC. And then Atlas gives you its own VPC somewhere. Um, I think, uh, yeah, so there's a way to get the Atlas VPC as well. So you set up a trust relationship between these two VPCs, right? So once you set things up here, you'll get a notification in your AWS console uh, that somebody is asking to set up a peer relationship. And then once you set the peer relationship up, you know, your, your node, node network can connect to your Atlas network. I think in the, in the, in the in the free version of the Atlas, MongoDB Atlas, I don't know if we, you can set up peering or not, or you know, I haven't been able to set it up. You, you, okay, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> okay, so this is the GitHub repository where you can get your, all the stuff that you like. All right, so, so that kind of basically concludes the interactive demo that I have. So I've got a few more screenshots to show you guys in terms of backups and you know, cluster sizing. Um, so this is an example where, um, just out of the box, right? You know, I think uh, I was talking about you know tech ops and how Atlas saves you the time, right? I feel like backups are one of the biggest things where you know you get a lot of bang for your buck in terms of you know using Atlas. Um, so this is the default schedule they have, uh, <clears throat> where um, you know the snapshots are actually saved. Yeah. So th there is you know diff the monthly snapshots are saved for almost a year, and then the weekly ones are for four weeks and. Um, and then the daily ones are for seven days, right? So let's look at how this is working in action for us, you know? So I'm gonna give you a screenshot of, you know, like our own. Um, then I can't get to the, let's just do it from here maybe. So um, let's see here, this is, so this is an example of monthly backup, right? So uh, it was taken on, you know, the 8th of May, and then it's of 2017, and it's available until, you know, the, the May of 2018, right? This is the monthly backup. And the weekly backup was taken on 22nd of May, and you can get it until, you know, the uh, you know, next month, right? That's, that's the weekly backup. And the daily backup, you know, is uh, 526, and you can get it until next week, one more week. And then the six hourly backup, you can get it for two more days. You know, it took it on 530th, and you can get it until, you know, six one or something like that. So this is kind of nice. You know, you, you've got all, all backups. And then even more useful beyond this, any of these backups, you can actually connect using Mongo Shell and do a query on these backups, right? So if you want to load the state of your database as of two days ago or even a month ago, right, you can do all that. So this is a, a feature called queryable backup, I think. That's the right term they use. Um, so if you want to grab a snapshot, right, and you, know, you would go to this, this kind of screen, and uh, it will let you download a, uh, a client, and I think you know, they have the, the script at the bottom there, um, like over here, right? So you download an executable from the screen, and you run the executable, right? So that's how it looks like when you actually run it. <clears throat> so when you run it, it makes a connection to your backup, and then you can actually query the backup, which is kind of a pretty nice feature. And we've actually used this a couple of times too. Uh, some of our players have, were questioning, you know, hey, how come I got so many points or how many points I had, right? So this is a very useful way to get back in time and find out, you know, what the state of the database was and, and answer their questions. Now, um, 
the other feature uh, of Atlas that's pretty handy is that you know as you get lower, you know you can actually grow the cluster pretty quickly, and some of this I'm sure is going to become even more useful when you have you know when you right now we're not actually, we're not sharding our data yet, and you guys know how you know things can get a little complicated when you have a shard cluster, right? Uh, so it's really nice to be able to just go to the console, and um, so w w what they have is they have this kind of. Uh, um, um, numbers like M50, M40, M30, right? Uh, with different configurations of, you know, RAM and storage and, uh, you know, how, how fast the disk, uh, how many IOPS you get on the disk. Um, so we had a situation where in, in December, you know, we were operating with a smaller cluster. And then in January, we got a lot of use, users signing up to our app. And suddenly we had to actually increase the size of the cluster. So we could just go here and, you know, click on, you know, point and click and the cluster size would all of a sudden become bigger. So that's, that's also pretty handy. And the other thing you could do is you could, we also use this to actually upgrade from 3.3 to 3.4. And we did all of this kind of while production was live. We didn't even have to, you know, take anything down. You know, it just worked right off the bat. So pretty happy with this feature too. All right, so I think that kind of brings us to the end of the uh, discussion, at least my presentation. Um, there's a lot of things we would like to do going forward as we grow bigger. Uh, <clears throat> so some of the social networking features that you know uh, you saw in our app, right? I think you know being able to do this kind of uh, um, graph lookup, for example, right? This is a feature that's, that's going to be pretty handy. Um, so I think you know, one of the things that you know I, I find very um, encouraging with MongoDB is that you know there's a lot of times your application grows, right? You have different requirements. You have a relational database requirement. You have a you know, document model requirement, and you also have a graph model requirement, right? So it's kind of nice that you know a single database can actually all of these purposes for you. So we're really looking forward to using the graph feature. Um, and uh, I think you know we could certainly you know, there's a lot of things we would like to do in terms of you know being able to analyze the data that we gather from the users and being able to present them with offers uh, to to make the game more engaging to them. Um, <clears throat> so I think uh, you know, there's various R and D areas we're looking into in terms of you know um, applying these Python-based uh, machine learning algorithms to the data we've got in the MongoDB. Um, but also, I think, um, you know, right now we use this lookup feature, which is kind of a, like, like a join of two MongoDB collections. Uh, but I think, you know, that lookup, uh, it works, I think, in, in a single region. Um, if you have a multi-region MongoDB cluster, uh, I believe we have to use something called MapReduce. So I think those are uh, some things that we need to do. And, uh, you know, if you look at some of the webcasts MongoDB has, right, the idea is to be able to write globally, meaning if you write in one place, it goes to all over the world if you have a multi-region cluster, and then you can read from pretty much, you know, anywhere where, you know, your reads are going to the local local uh, server that's close to, closest to the customer, right? Um, so, so, all right, I think, you know, clearly some of these are, are uh, so we are, we're using some kind of a monitoring, right? Now we use something called Neuralic to monitor. There's a Neuralic plugin for MongoDB. Uh, but I think we can certainly see, use uh, a little bit more um, detailed end-to-end -end monitoring of the whole stack. Um, so I think that's an area that can use some improvement. And also, uh, if you look at Mongoose, right? Mongoose is like a very common framework that all of us use in the main stack. But uh, sometimes when there's an issue, you know, Mongoose is not officially supported uh, by Atlas. I wish it would be um, because it's such an integral part of the main stack. Uh, so that's a request I have for MongoDB to make Mongoose into an officially supported framework. <clears throat> all right. So I think, you know, yeah, that's, uh, that's all I've got for you guys. Thank you for your attention.